that business schools uh, really need to be community engaged. And so uh, when I ask my faculty, uh, can you come out and talk to the, the, the we're a business school, we're doing research that is helpful, that is extraordinary, but we have to communicate it to our stakeholders. Some of them look at me and say, but I say, but you can do it in language that your grandmother will understand. Sometimes that's hard for us, the academics, because we're too used to talking to ourselves uh, too much. But we really have uh, a lot to give to the community, a lot to learn from the community as a business school. And so this is uh, an initiative designed to bring us closer to you, the financial community of Toronto, uh, for us to showcase what we do, uh, for us to uh, broaden maybe your understanding of basic concepts of finance, what our people are working on. Uh, it's for the benefit of, of ourselves and for you. And so we, we hope this is going to be of value. Uh, Richard's uh, talk is, uh, I, I've heard this once before, and it's a really very fascinating. I, I have a CV here, and he has, uh, if he wanted, already wasn't a faculty member, I'd hire him. Uh, there's 46 referee papers uh, and uh, four or five books. Uh, the, the book that uh, I really think is something that all of us should be reading, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to ask him when he got into behavioral finance, because when he graduated from the University of Toronto, uh, finance was not behavioral at all. This is a very modern part of finance, a modern part of, of all of economics. When I did my PhD, uh, behavior was profit maximization or utility maximization and the, the notion that uh, you know, we would actually be talking about people like Kahneman and Tversky, uh, psychologists was something that if you try to say that in graduate school you probably wouldn't graduate. And so even uh, we, uh, you know, at the pillars of, of economics, uh, worshipping at the, the high altar, realize that the altar is changing because uh, the things that we have learned and the things that we teach always have got to be uh, revised. Uh, just like any other business, just like your business is, uh, if, you don't, if you don't change, you, if you don't go with what's better, uh, you can't just be, uh, you know, if you stick with your, your old principles and don't change, you'll be out of the market. And the same with, uh, with, with the economic, with theory, with finance, with all the things we teach. It always has to evolve because there's always a, a new concept, something better that's, that's coming. And we have to be at the cutting edge. And we at the Groot are at the cutting edge, as you'll see. So uh, we're delighted you're here today. And without f further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Brenda Richard and uh, his talk. Uh, and I've seen this talk before. The, the first slide is a wonderful one. Richard. Thank you, Len. Thank you very much. We have a lot of wires here, so we're just making sure that we, uh, we don't trip over the wires. Um, normally, I like to uh, wander a little bit, be but because of the fact I'm attached, um, I probably won't wander uh, too far today. Um, actually, Len, I I'm tempted to begin by answering your question, when and why did I get interested in behavioral finance? But there's a bit of a story uh, to it, so maybe I'll kind of defer that till the end of my talk, and hopefully there's a little bit of time. But you're absolutely right. I graduated, in, in fact, uh, Len was a professor of mine. He taught me microeconomics uh, a few years ago. We won't necessarily <laughs> count the number. I, I don't remember the number myself. But uh, no, I found it a fascinating course and for that reason. And I enjoyed other courses at University of Toronto as well. So I ended up continuing and doing a master's and eventually uh, a, a PhD. And uh, yeah, definitely, I don't think anyone was exposing us to behavioral economics or behavioral finance at the time. So it was, it was definitely something I got into uh, later on. OK, so um, anyway, the, um, the talk is called Tiger Woods, Stocks as Gambling and um, Behavioral Finance. Basically, what I want to do is just give you a little bit of a flavor as to what behavioral finance is all about. And um, my hook is to talk about some very fun, very accessible, spicy research that's been done recently 
on uh, Tiger Woods and other professional golfers, and also stocks as uh, a gambling. So here's a picture of Tiger Woods, and uh, he's, of course, looking at uh, a putt. He's deciding whether or not to hit a little left, a little right. Does Tiger Woods have a higher probability of making a birdie putt or a par putt? Think about it. I'll get back to that question later on. And once we know the answer, will that tell us anything about financial markets? And I think it probably does. Okay, a couple of pictures here. There's um, some traders on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. And there's um, casino gambling, a roulette table. They couldn't have anything to do with each other, right? Well, maybe some people treat the stock market as if they're gambling. Do some people treat investing in the stock market as if they were gambling in a casino? And if so, does that have an impact on market prices? OK, so this is what I want to try to cover over the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, first of all, what is uh, behavioral finance? Some of you know, I think, uh, the answer to that quite well. Why does it matter? I want to talk about some of the psychological foundations and um, the impact of those foundations on investor behavior. And I also want to talk about a few cases, a few famous cases, where markets seem to get it wrong and what we can learn from those cases. So what is behavioral finance all about? Well, basically, as Len was just saying, standard economics and finance, call it modern, call it conventional, is very much based on the assumption of rationality. Behavioral finance says that, well, sometimes psychology plays a role, and we can't ignore that. Because if a lot of people are making the same mistake at the same time, it might have an impact on markets. So why is it maybe useful for financial practitioners to gain some knowledge in this particular realm? Well, um, for one thing, firms designing financial products, and this is particularly true in the pension space, especially for defined contribution pensions, they can use behavioral finance sometimes to uh, improve these financial products. Um, jumping to the last point, more controversially, behavioral finance researchers argue and try to demonstrate that sometimes investor error, investor psychology, will actually have an impact on markets. Now, when you tell that, when you say that to practitioners, to people in the real world, they say, of course that's true. But Sometimes it's hard to convince academics of that. So let me give you a little bit of an overview of, let me call it the history of academic finance. If you go back to the journals, the finance journals in the 40, late 40s and early 50s, and you look at some of the research papers, they don't look anything like modern finance journals. In those days, Academic finance was very case-oriented, very institutional, very accounting-oriented as well. Here's a quote from Nobel Prize-winning economist Robert Merton. He described academic finance in those days as a collection of anecdotes, rules of thumb, and a manipulation of accounting data. OK, so what, what changed over time? Well, starting in the late 50s and um, moving into the 60s, um, you had some very important theoretical developments that occurred in uh, finance. M&M &M stands for Modigliani and Miller, various theorems about uh, dividend policy, capital structure policy, modern portfolio theory, that's Markowitz in the late 50s, for which he eventually won a Nobel Prize, efficient markets hypothesis which essentially says that price and value are pretty much always the same. And the first asset pricing model, called the CAPM, the Capital Asset Pricing Model. And these theories really created modern finance, and they were, they were grounded in rationality. And the early empirical work 
testing these theories was, for the most part, pretty favorable. But over time, more and more anomalies, more and more um, issues were discovered. And it seemed like a lot of these anomalies were probably due to psychology. And that's when the behavioral finance counterattack actually began. And so um, one of the early papers was by Kahneman and Tversky on prospect theory, but then you had more work done in the 80s and 90s. Some of the famous people in behavioral finance are people like David Hirschleifer and Richard Thaler and Terence O'Dean, who came to McMaster recently. So more and more work's been done, and now it's becoming um, increasingly uh, the norm to consider psychological or even social, sociological explanations for certain behaviors. Let me read this quote that was penned by Robert Schiller, writing in a journal about 25 years ago. Investing in speculative assets is a social activity. Investors spend a substantial part of their leisure time discussing investments, reading about investments, or gossiping about others' successes or failures in investing. It is thus plausible that investors' behavior and hence prices of speculative assets would be influenced by social movements. Now, when people read or hear something like that today, they say, well, that's kind of obvious, nothing too really exciting there. That was viewed as eccentric when it was written about 25 or 30 years ago. And that really gives you a sense of, of how the profession has started to evolve and uh, how psychological explanations for various financial phenomena are now taken seriously. So um, today, when there's something that's not easy to explain using conventional finance and rationality, it's uh, increasingly acceptable to consider behavioral explanations. OK, so let me move now to number two. And this is where I'll spend most of my time today. Uh, psychological foundations and investment behavior. Okay, so uh, psychology is important. What sorts of errors are leading to suboptimal behavior? Well, normally they're categorized into four, four uh, groupings. First is uh, inflated self-assessment or just overconfidence. The second is uh, a family, a series of heuristics that can lead to cognitive bias that can get investors into trouble. Uh, number three is obvious to everyone. Sometimes people just get emotional and they make bad financial decisions for that reason. Just go back to 2008. In, uh, in that particular year, of course, uh, lots of emotions in markets, right? And finally, irrational risk preferences. Okay, um, overconfidence. Um, let me just quickly uh, touch upon a study that was done by Terence O'Dean. Um, models that uh, incorporate overconfidence tend to predict that since people are too sure of their opinions on securities, they'll trade too much, they'll transact too often. And uh, here's a, a bar chart that I like to uh, show students. This is from a study by Barbara and O'Dean in 2000. Basically, uh, what they've done here is they've taken about 60,000 brokerage accounts and they've divided them up into five quintiles and the quintiles vary on the basis of trading activity. So quintile one is uh, people who are not trading too much. Those are the buy and holders, right? And then moving from one over, these people are trading more. When you get to these guys here or these uh, women, um, they're doing lots of trading, right? So why do you trade? You should trade because you think you can improve your portfolio, but of course you incur transaction costs, commissions, market spreads, right? So um, you should only really trade if you're going to do better, right? Okay. Um, the gray bar 
is the gross return ignoring transaction costs and the darker bar is the net return after transaction costs have been brought in. So there's not much of a difference in Q1, but jumping over to Q5, there's a big gap because there's lots of transactions taking place. The problem is they're really not doing much better in terms of gross returns. In terms of net returns, they're doing a lot worse. So the conclusion from this study, which seems to make good sense, is these folks here think they know lots, they think their analytical abilities are quite sharp, but that doesn't translate into earning higher net returns, right? That's pretty clear evidence that people, these are retail investors, that's pretty clear evidence that a lot of retail investors think they know something, but they actually don't know so much. Okay, um, next, heuristics. A heuristic is just a rule of thumb. And sometimes rules of thumb make good sense. They lead to good decisions, but sometimes they can get you into trouble, especially if they're used out of context. So uh, here's one rule of thumb that I sometimes talk about. You know, if you think about people who go to a buffet, very often they take a little bit of everything. They want to try all the dishes that are available at the buffet. That's an example of the diversification heuristic, right? That way you don't miss out on a good thing. And of course, diversification in finance is a good word. It's not, it's not pejorative, right? But is diversification always good in finance? Well, not necessarily. And so let me uh, give you some evidence from a survey that I participated in, and actually someone else is sitting in the audience who also participated in this uh, survey. And um, anyway, this is one of the questions that we put on the survey. Uh, we asked, this was a survey of around 2,000 defined contribution pension plan members in Canada. And uh, we asked them lots of things, right? But I'm just going to focus on this. We wanted to see what kind of knowledge they had. And this is one question to attack that issue. So we said to them, OK, you've got $100,000 to invest and you have three funds to choose from. And we were very vague about it. On the first question, we said we have a government bond fund, a corporate bond fund, and a stock fund. No further information, right? We had a second question as well. But notice the funds are a little different. Now we have a single bond fund. So the governments and the corporates are now merged into the one bond fund. But now we have two stock funds. They didn't necessarily know what a growth fund was or a value fund was, but they could see they were both stock funds, right? So um, how did they answer? Well, um, how should they answer? Well, of course, people are going to have different risk tolerance and age proximity to retirement, of course, is uh, a, a big issue as well. But the main thing that we were looking for with that particular question was, well, do people understand asset allocation? If people understand asset allocation, they should be roughly consistent between the two questions. So let's say uh, Jane Doe should have, or she wants, a 50-50 stock bond mix. So first question, there's only one stock fund. She should put all her money into the stock fund, right? Second question, two stock funds add up the two numbers, should be roughly, you know, between 45 and 55. That's roughly consistent, right? But what if she really doesn't have any idea of what she's doing? What if she doesn't understand asset allocation, right? She might fall back on this diversification heuristic. So this is what we found when we conducted the uh, survey. This is the first question. On the first question, uh, one out of the three funds is an equity fund. Okay, this is a frequency distribution. Um, you can see that the mode is actually at a 50% asset allocation, but um, most of the respondents were actually to the left. And in fact, the average was uh, 43%. So the average equity exposure on the first question was 43%. Now, if you just stare at this, watch how this changes. So now two of the three funds are equity funds, and now you can see the weight of the distribution. A lot of people still said 50, right? But now the weight of the distribution has shifted rightward. And what that suggests is a lot of people didn't really 
Uh, only 27% were roughly, very roughly consistent, and that suggests a lot of people don't really understand asset allocation, right? Okay, and the um, problem is they used a heuristic, the diversification heuristic, which got them into trouble in this particular context. Okay. Um, disposition effect, okay, I, I made the point earlier that often people make financial decisions because of emotions. Uh, you can also make financial decisions because you're afraid of later on experience, experiencing an emotion when you make that decision. Uh, the disposition effect is the finding that people are much more likely to sell winning stocks than they are when it comes to losing stocks. Why is that? Well, the problem with selling a losing stock is you have to face up to the fact that you ex post made a bad investment. You lost money, right? And you might regret having made a bad investment. So you perhaps hold off selling that losing stock because you fear the regret that you might experience if you end up selling that losing investment. So that's an example of emotion perhaps impacting financial decision making. Okay, next I want to get to irrational risk preferences. And now I'm going to get to um, Tiger Woods and um, the casino gambling in a moment. Um, how do people make decisions when they have to make them and the decisions involve risk? There's a theory um, that's used in economics and finance called expected utility theory. It's a normative theory, which means that's how people should act, how people should act when they're making decisions under risk, right? Well, um, its main competitor is called prospect theory, and this was developed by Kahneman and Tversky, and eventually Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in large part for that particular theory, and that's a theory that isn't how people should act, it's how people actually do act. And if you're interested in, in this um, particular issue, I highly recommend a book that uh, Kahneman wrote recently, a couple of years ago, and it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he talks about the development of some of their theories, including prospect theory. But um, anyway, two of the uh, main characteristics of prospect theory are loss aversion, and what's called probability weighting. Now, I'll say what probability weighting is later on, but let me focus on loss aversion. <clears throat> the idea of loss aversion is people hate losing in money or in other life outcomes, right? So think of it like this. Um, if you are given a dollar, that makes you a little bit happy, right? But if someone takes a dollar away from you, that makes you very unhappy. So losing is worse than winning, even though we equate the absolute values of the sums involved. And there's a lot of evidence that indicates that's true. <clears throat> okay, back to uh, Tiger Woods now. Very interesting study done in the American Economic Review a couple of years ago. They came across a terrific data set, and of course researchers are often looking for great data sets. Apparently, the PGA tracks um, golf shots and putts with tremendous precision. <laughs> okay. um, this study used about 2.5 million golf putts attempted on the PGA Tour during a five-year period. Very detailed data, so we know exactly how far to the uh, centimeter, to the millimeter, uh, the putts were on the green, the location on the green, uh, everything you could possibly imagine, right? Okay, so um, these are pros, of course. Uh, so most of the putts were for par or for birdie. And in fact, 87% uh, were either for par or birdie, right? So let's think about it. If you're gonna win a golf tournament, you wanna try really, really hard on every shot. So if you can somehow um, make two putts identical in, in every way, and, and that's what the researchers did in their econometric analysis. If you can make two putts identical in every single way, except one is a par putt and one is a birdie putt, 
since people should be trying equally hard because there's lots of dollars, millions of dollars, sometimes at stake, then you'd expect par putts and equivalent birdie putts to be sunk with very close to equal probability, right? Um, question, yes? Yeah, no, uh, good point. That's the first thing I thought of when I started to read the paper. I don't remember the exact way they did it, but they did control for that. Uh, one, one obvious way is um, you could um, delete from your data. I, I don't remember if they did this, but you could delete from your data set all putts that uh, were not the first putt, right? So for example, you could get onto the green, um, and then your first putt would be a birdie putt and you could get onto the green and your first putt would be a par putt, right? So then there'd be no sort of uh, learning from the previous putt. So uh, I don't remember exactly, that. I read the study a few years ago, but um, they, they did an amazing number of controls and they did, con that was one of the first things they controlled for. That's a good point though. So um, anyway, it turns out that uh, par putts are sunk more often than uh, birdie putts by about 2%. And it turns out about 94% of all golfers are uh, subject to this behavior, uh, including Tiger Woods. So that's why uh, Tiger Woods is kind of the hook, right? He's not really special in this uh, respect. So uh, what's going on here? Uh, how is this loss aversion? Well, if you're a professional golfer, um, a par is what you should get, right? And par means zero. You're not going up or down, right? So, um, you're trying to get negatives, which are birdies. And, and that's like a gain, because you want to win. Those are gains, right? Uh, on the other hand, a bogey, which puts you over par, is akin to a loss, okay? So maybe loss aversion is what's going on here. Maybe, in fact, the only explanation that seems to make sense is maybe people are uh, expending more effort on the par putts because they really don't want to lose. They really don't want to get those bogeys. And the article actually provides a few quotes that seem to suggest that type of psychology on the part of golfers. Well, OK, what's this got to do with uh, finance? Let me try to connect it with one important phenomenon in uh, financial markets, and it's the so-called equity premium puzzle. Uh, we know, of course, investors want to be rewarded for taking on risk. And since equities are riskier than bonds or, or T-bills, you, you should do a bit better if you put your money in stocks, right? So no one would question that. But researchers have come up with models and long-involved stories to suggest that the equity premium is just too high. So people uh, are getting rewarded for the risk they're taking on when they invest in stocks just too much. Okay, so how can loss aversion perhaps explain this? Well, if people have what's called a narrow frame, which in this context means they're looking at their portfolio every few months, maybe every year, often the market doesn't do that great over a short period of time. So what do they notice? They notice losses. So they suddenly think stocks are very risky. Of course, people should be investing in the stock market for the long term. And over the long term, stocks, I forgot 2008 for a moment. Over the long term, uh, stocks are not, are not that uh, risky because the ups and the downs tend to average out. So the fact that people are subject to this narrow framing means they may be shy away from stocks too much and that could lead to stocks being on average undervalued, which means that returns on stocks on average are higher, leading to the equity premium puzzle. So it's possible. There's, there's other uh, arguments um, for what's going on, but it's one, one good argument, I think. OK, let me now turn to um, the second um, research paper that I wanted to highlight today. And uh, that is, I've just been talking about investing in the stock market, right? Okay, well, now I'm talking about lotteries. They shouldn't really have anything 
to do with each other, right? Okay. Uh, and in fact, I made the point that an equity premium exists because stocks are riskier, therefore you need to reward people for taking on risk. People are normally risk averse, right? It's one of the things that we teach finance students. Risk aversion means higher returns for risky securities. And yet, why do people go to Casino Niagara? Why do people go to Las Vegas? Why do people buy lottery tickets? What's going on there? Because if you actually calculate the expected return from a dollar gambled at the roulette table or $20 spent at the corner store buying a lottery ticket, we all can quickly figure out that it's a negative expected return. So it's something that's quite risky and the return is negative. So how can we possibly account for such strange behavior? So why is it that people can be risk seeking in the case of things like gambling or lotteries? Well, prospect theory has an explanation which basically says that people overweight low probabilities. So think of a lottery, maybe the chance of winning a lottery is one in a million. And people will hear that and say one in a million, but somehow they'll feel like it's maybe one in 100,000, or they'll act as if it's one in 100,000. They're somehow overweighting those very low probabilities. Somehow their psychology is doing that, right? Okay. So now let me talk about what are called lottery stocks. Research has been done into who buys lottery tickets, not lottery stocks. And um, the research that's been done has found that young people with low income, males in particular, unmarried, living in urban areas, they tend to be disproportionate purchasers of lottery tickets. Okay, so um, a researcher named Alok Kumar asked himself, well, are certain stocks like lotteries? And he said, what kind of characteristics would a stock need to have to kind of look like a lottery ticket to some investors, right? And he said, well, three things. Uh, the price should be fairly low, so it looks like a, buying a cheap lottery ticket. Uh, there should be high positive skewness. What that means is once or twice in the past, there was a very nice return. So people at least think there's some chance of a very good payoff, right? And finally, you want to have volatility. Once again, people want to feel like there's some, some possibility of a, of a good payoff, and you need volatility for that, right? So what did he find? He found if you use those three characteristics to characterize lottery stocks, right, he found that the same people who tend to buy lottery tickets also tend to buy lottery stocks. Males, young, single, unmarried, living in urban areas. <coughs> Further evidence, institutional investors stay away from stocks with those characteristics. And it turns out if a particular segment of the investing community gets too excited about a particular type of security, what they often do is they push up prices too high. If prices are pushed up too high, that means returns going forward will probably be lower. So did this happen in the case of these lottery stocks? The answer is yes. On a risk-adjusted basis, lottery-type stocks earned at least 4% less than other stocks. And typical lottery stock investors could have bumped up their return by close to 3% just by steering clear of those lottery stocks. So this is perhaps a good example of investor psychology impacting market prices. How am I doing for uh, time, roughly? Uh, Are you five, ten minutes? Five, ten minutes, okay. So I just want to know what to, uh, to cut going ten forward. Ten? Oh, good. Okay, we're pretty good then, okay. Okay, so I, I think I do have uh, a little bit of time to just quickly touch upon some points in uh, number three. Um, here I want to talk about, uh, maybe I'll just focus on one famous case of the market getting it wrong. Okay. Um, 
Royal Dutch Shell uh, has a very interesting corporate history. So let me give you a, a sense of what I mean by that. In 1907, Royal Dutch and Shell actually merged all their operations, but it wasn't a full-blown merger. In fact, what they did is they created what's called a DLC, a dual listed company. All cash flows adjusted for corporate tax considerations and control rights were contractually split between the shareholders of Royal Dutch and Shell in a 60-40 ratio. Okay? But they actually were separate companies and the key point is the stocks were different and they traded um, differently, right? Prices were different. Okay, but if, if you know this is what's going on and you should be able to figure out a relationship between the price of the value, I should say, of Royal Dutch stock and of Shell stock. And if you see that there's some uh, divergence from what should be the relationship between the two prices, then there should be a rather obvious arbitrage opportunity, right? Okay, so this is a graph from a research paper that was written about um, 15 or so years ago. And um, this red line here is parity. So in other words, if we were always on that red line, then the price of Royal Dutch and the price of Shell would be uh, at par in the sense that there was no arbitrage opportunity, right? But very often, there was a pretty sizable difference, uh, or deviation, I should say, from, from parity. Okay? So if you think about it, um, let's say you're in a situation like uh, here, right, in, in the late 90s, and you see that Royal Dutch is dear relative to Shell, so what arbitragers always try to do is they buy what's cheap and short sell what's expensive, so you would buy Shell stock and you would short sell Royal Dutch stock and you could actually create a zero cost portfolio. But if, if um, this is the situation, you're actually going to be able to uh, bring in some positive cash flows over time because of the deviation from parity. So you might think, well, that's a money machine. Why don't I just do that whenever, whenever there's a deviation from parity? Well, the reason is, oops, um, the reason is what's called noise trader risk, okay? Uh, one of the uh, company, one of the funds that tried to do that in 1998 was long-term capital management, which of course is uh, quite famous. And um, they, uh, of, of course, um, had the view <laughs> right, and uh, Myron Scholes, an alum of uh, McMaster, uh, they had the view that whenever these uh, pricing imbalances existed, they should try to arbitrage them. And uh, I mean, academically, it was a pretty smart view. The problem is that sometimes wrong prices get even more wrong in the short run. So let's say that two prices should be the same, but there's a bit of an imbalance. So you're going to bet that the two will converge, right? But in the short run, it's possible things can get worse. Now, if you've got deep pockets and you can wait it out, you're probably going to do just fine. But if you're highly leveraged, like long-term capital management, you can get into trouble really fast. And that was one of the bets they made uh, that actually didn't work out too well. Uh, it wasn't the major one. I think they're big... Um, uh, loss was in the Russian bond market, if I remember correctly, but this is one of their, their smaller bets that went south, and I think they ended up losing about $200 million from this particular uh, bet. Okay, so this is an example of what's called noise trader risk. The idea of noise trader risk is in the short run, incorrect prices can become even more incorrect, and that's why um, markets are probably not as efficient as many academics might like to think. Academics will sometimes argue, well, if prices are out of whack, 
you know, we probably have a, a very large group of well-capitalized arbitragers who can arbitrage away the pricing errors. But this um, noise trader risk, it's actually one of the uh, reasons why arbitrage has its limits. There was a famous paper written um, about 15 years ago by Schleifer and some other people uh, called Limits to Arbitrage. And, and that was one of the key uh, papers in behavioral finance because it really uh, laid the foundation for the idea that markets have um, a good justification for not always being perfectly efficient. Okay, so um, I did some skipping there. Uh, if you want to learn more, uh, I can push my book, I suppose. Uh, behavioral finance, psychology, decision making, and markets. A few of you uh, in the audience, I think, have already uh, seen the book. I have one or two former uh, students here. And uh, I would love to uh, hear from you later on if you have some particular questions or comments. So just a little bit of contact information. Uh, one thing I will push a little bit is I've got this blog called behavioralfinanceresearch.com. And in that blog, I review uh, not my research, but I review other research that's done in behavioral finance. And um, I try to make the, uh, the posts uh, quite accessible, sometimes entertaining. And uh, so take a look at that. Maybe you'll find something helpful there. So I think I'm probably about right time-wise. OK. Thank you.